Greetings, everybody. Kevin McFarland here. Thanks for joining me again on the podcast. Wanted to start the podcast a little different this time. I uh, wanted to start with a couple shout outs. Wanted to give a shout out to my friend Bill Barrett, who's a nursing student who listens to the podcast. He was nice enough to send me a, a comment uh, telling me how much he enjoys the podcast and how much it's been helping him as he gets through his last couple clinical shifts. I wish you luck, Bill. You're going to get past that NCLEX and be a nurse before you know it. The second shout out is to Jennifer Stafford, who is a clinical nurse educator who left us a nice comment on iTunes. She was the first comment posted uh, in iTunes for the podcast. At some point, I'm going to have to have Jennifer on as a guest. She would be super entertaining. So again, thanks, Jennifer. Remember, if you haven't done so already, please leave us not only a rating in iTunes, but a review as well. The reviews are what help other people find this podcast and makes it more discoverable to nurses looking for an interesting podcast to listen to. Go ahead and leave a review, and uh, you may be the next person shouted out on the podcast. My guest today is an emergency nurse practitioner who knew that ER was his calling from the days when he was a paramedic. I hope you enjoy today's podcast with Andrew Bowman. First, I'm going to do is ask you to introduce yourself. Um, Tell us who you are. Tell us your credentials. Um and and what you do now and a little bit about your background okay so i'm andrew bowman uh i'm currently an acute care nurse practitioner working in emergency Uh, i work for a contracted emergency physician group we cover three different community-sized hospitals uh in the midwest uh the advanced practice providers, the PAs and NPs that are members of the group work in two of the emergency departments. The third one is a freestanding ER that doesn't quite have the census built up yet to uh, require a uh, advanced practice provider helping out. So we work in two of the three uh, centers that we cover. Uh, Basically started out uh, 1982 as an EMT and then quickly became a paramedic and then graduated nursing school from Purdue University in 1991 and have always worked EMS and emergency department nursing and medicine uh, ever since 1982. Uh, There was quite a bit of a lag time between graduating from nursing school to starting and finishing my uh, master's from my nurse practitioner. I graduated with that in 2007. And ever since then, I've been working as an NP in the emergency department and have had ups and downs, but overall, uh, it's an enjoyable step that I've taken. Nice. So what, what made you decide to get into nursing? So you started off as a, as an EMS uh, in EMS and as a right. paramedic, right. what, why the, cho- right. why the jump to the other side of the, the gurney? Uh, as I jokingly tell people, I prefer climate control. <laughs> Understand. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, working in Indiana. It's brutally cold in the wintertime. It's horribly hot and humid in the summertime. And I enjoyed uh, the emergency care aspect of things. But I was really getting tired of, you know, slogging myself in and out of rain and snow and heat and humidity. And I still wanted to take care of patients who were experiencing emergencies, but really wanted to stay inside. And so nursing seemed like a nice natural progression. Nice. So there was uh, Purdue was in my hometown and they've got a very good school of nursing. And so got in and on from there. And at what point in your career were you like, okay, I made the right choice. This is exactly what I'm meant to do. Uh, I think still back when I was a paramedic, uh, I'm not going to, you know, fool anybody and say, you know, I was the uber grand paramedic of them all. I, I made mistakes, uh, but I felt like I did a good job and I enjoyed what I was doing. And I enjoyed not only the decision-making process of, uh, you know, forming a pre-hospital or field diagnosis, and that's not a bad word, diagnosis 
EMS personnel do form a diagnosis. Absolutely. Uh, and even though a lot of people disagree with that, uh, but also then the, the procedural side of things, uh, doing the advanced procedures, intubations, uh, workforce service where we could do central lines. This is way back before, you know, IOs were the common access for wow. patients. You couldn't get a line in. So we placed central lines. We did intubations. Uh, and then by, work, by working out of a hospital-based service, working in the emergency department and we weren't out on calls, uh, got trained to do other things like do chest tubes and things like that. In fact, one wow. day, a neurosurgeon allowed me to place uh, an intracranial monitor on a patient. So, holy cow! Had a, lot of good men- had, a, had a lot of good mentors and had a lot of fun, and realized, you know, back when I was still a medic, that you know, this is what I want to do. That's awesome. I think for many paramedics, they find it a natural transition from um, the the uh, EMS side of the house to to emergency nursing, and they make fantastic emergency nurses. The hard part is they got to get through nursing school. Yeah, that was. Uh, that yeah, was... I I would agree with that because there was a paramedic in my nursing class who failed miserably, and I think it was due to the came into the attitude of, "Well, I'm a medic. What are you going to teach me?" Absolutely. And and he didn't take the opportunity to learn to know what he didn't know. And yeah, he was he was gone quick. You know. When I went to nursing school, the only person who knew going out, you know, first to getting started was my uh, admissions advisor. She knew that I was a paramedic, <laughs> but I didn't, te- I kept didn't it, tell kept it quiet, huh? my instructors. Got to quiet. That's Eventually, funny. of course, they find out because you go to clinical sites, which are the hospitals you work out, and everyone knows you. <laughs> and it's like, well, how do they know you? So, oh, I'm, I'm a medic here. And so, yeah, it gets out, but I didn't go into class and say, Hey, I'm a medic. You know, can't teach me anything. I went in with the attitude of, yeah, I'm a medic and I have my skill set and I have my experiences, but there is so much more to learn. Absolutely. And I got, and because of that attitude, I got to do some things that at the time, uh, my nursing student colleagues didn't get to experience because they were doing the basic stuff, skills that I'd already learned you know, yeah. years before. You know, it was just a good opportunity to take that attitude to, you know, let them find out on their own what I can and can't do. And from that, I was able to do a lot more things than most of the students were allowed to do. Absolutely. When I was in nursing school, there was a, on my first term, there was a young lady who was a, I was an EMT and I was an EMT instructor at the community college where I was uh, going to school. So that was a little bit awkward. Um, but we had a, uh, a paramedic who was in the class and one day we were they were going over vital signs and they were talking about blood pressures and they were talking about you know getting vital signs and I'd say ninety nine percent of it was like a huh yeah okay I already know all this stuff but there were a couple things and I don't remember exactly what they were but there were a couple things that I was like huh I did not know that 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 fills in a little bit of a blank that I had and I had no idea um, and so I, you know I was like okay I'm I'm gonna pay attention and, and listen here and. The yep. young lady that was in class with me was like, I remember telling one of the instructors, she's like, well, me and Kevin, we're EMTs, so, you know, we already know all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, you keep me out of this. I'm yeah, not, don't throw me in there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm here to learn, and I'm, and this isn't EMT school, this is nursing school. And that's exactly what the nursing instructor said. She said, this is nursing school, it's completely different. And it, and it really is. Um, very complimentary skill sets, but completely different. Oh, sure. What I remember, probably one of the funniest moments uh, that kind of ties into this in nursing school. So uh, med surge year uh, at Purdue, that was our junior year where we did a whole year of med surge nursing. Mm-hmm. And that's where they learned, you know, how to do IVs and things like that. So, the, you know, one of the first classes of the semester, you know, there's 30 of them in the classroom. We're talking about different types of IV access, you know, butterflies and angiocasts and things like that. And, the, you know, it's a three-hour lecture session in the morning, and, you know, the first hour is just all talking about the different kinds of IVs. And during the break, the instructor goes, now, when we come back, I'm going to take this half of the room, and Andrew's going to take that half of the room. I'm going, like, wait, what? I'm going to do what? <laughs> he goes, well, you do this all the time, don't you? I said, yeah, so we're going to teach us. But okay, well, you know, do I get paid? <laughs> right. 
She, right? She just laughed. She just laughed at me. She thought, no. She's like, oh, she's like, oh you're cute. <laughs> when we were, um, our, our IV training included a um, video about the potential dangers of an IV, of initiating an IV, a demo um, where the nursing instructor tried on an IV arm um, unsuccessfully to get a flash, of course, uh, and and did a kind of half-hearted IV and then said, okay, now pair up and go practice on each other. And she's like, you'll be, you'll be fine. And I was like going, yes, I will be fine. And, and my, my person that I'm with will be fine. Everyone else. Oh, I don't know. Not so much. So sure enough, we go off, we do it. And it was one of those, it was like the end of the day. And they're like, okay, as soon as you successfully get an IV, you get to go home. And I was like, all right guys, I'll see you later. (laughs) And and I ended up sticking around and helping a couple of people get theirs um, that needed some help. And, and and that was, that was nice. But my fourth semester of nursing school, um, one of our clinical days, we had kind of a slow clinical day and there was something going on. I think that there was like some kind of hospital inspectors in the house, in the house or something. And, um, the, the nursing unit was like, Oh, let's just kind of have the students just stand down for a few minutes. So my clinical instructor <clears throat> who I just adored was like, Hey, do you guys want to practice IVs? Do you guys want to learn how to do that and practice that? And I was like, Oh, everyone was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. That'd be great. And she goes, great. Kevin's going to teach you. Uh, and I was like, all right, let's do this. Um, I mean, I taught it, I was teaching it in the EMT level all the time. So it was, you know, certainly easy for me to teach. And, you know, we sat there and spent uh, an entire clinical shift practicing IVs on each other, which was, was good for them. Not so good right. for my arms, but it was good for them. Right. So that's cool. Yeah. I sacrificed my arms a lot over the years. So no, yes. More, more times than I, I care to remember. Tell me about a patient who changed the way you practice. Uh, a patient that changed the way I practice. That's a tough question, Kevin. It is a tough question. They get they get tougher. There's some easy ones, but they get they, they're they're kind of like this. I mean, because 37 years, there's been a lot of patients. Uh, who patient that changed my practice. What's one that stands out to you that whenever you see a new nurse, you're like, hold up, let me tell you a little something that I learned the hard way that maybe you learned from a patient. I guess there's no one single patient, but it's just maybe an amalgam of patients over the years that you can't go in with a bias. Uh, when you're approaching your patient and God knows we're all guilty of that to some degree at it's some point or another, me, especially. Oh, it's really hard not to do. Yeah. You know, you see your frequent flyer and they're there for the same thing that they were there for two days ago and five mm-hmm. days ago and 10 days ago and 20 days ago. And you're just you're like, Hi, you're bro. rolling your eyes. <laughs> and, and so, mm. you know, that type of patient, maybe not a singular patient, but that type of patient, has taught me well to, yeah, you know, take 10 or 15 seconds in the privacy of your dictation room or where we have to be, just go, oh, frick, frick, you know, why are they here? But then take a deep breath, grab the chart, and walk in the room and say, you know, hey, Jim, Andrew, nurse practitioner, what's going on today? How can we help you? And just go in with, like it's, like you have new eyes, like it's a fresh set of eyes looking at this person. And it's some days it's hard. And some days I still fail at that, but to try to remind yourself every single time that this might be the one time there's something really bad going on and you're going to miss it. If you don't go into the idea that each time they come in, there's potential that, this is the real thing. This is something bad this time. And it's not just the run of the mill. I'm here because I've got nothing else to do on a Tuesday. Reason to come to the ER. Have you ever been burned by that? Oh yes. Yes, I have. Um, had a guy that, you know, we see a lot and came in with his usual complaint of, uh, his chest hurting 
And we were a little slow at getting things and getting the IV. And, you know, he was having a STEMI. Uh, no, no, fortunately, oh, no. you know, fortunately he recovered well, did well, but you know, our metrics on that guy weren't so good. We were slow on the EKG. We were slow on the IV. Uh, obviously as soon as we got the EKG, we saw what was going on, but you know, it was one of those, you know, Jim's here. And you know, of course that's a euphemism. Jim's here for his chest pain again, and we'll get to him when we get to him. And, glad we got to him <laughs> yeah uh, it's, it's kind of funny when you know someone goes back and looks at it and you're like they're like hey why did it take so long to get the ekg and you're like because it's jim and they're like it's jim <laughs> and they're like uh, i yeah. don't know th- i don't well someone yeah. might someone, might, someone yeah. may say i don't know yeah. what that means but someone else might be like oh yeah. i get it yeah and it's and it's it's not going to be a you know if that went to you know if he had a bad outcome you know, he, obviously he lost a few more myocardial cells in that delay, but you know, if he'd had a bad functional outcome and he decided to sue, there's no defense. Absolutely. You know, someone would say, you know, isn't your metric, Mr. Bowman, 10 minutes for an EKG? Yes, it is. But you were 20 minutes? Yes, we were. <laughs> yep. So, yep. so yeah, there's, there's no defense. Yeah. Here's another tough question for you. Tell me about, tell me about your first medical error. Or first, uh, either medication or, or, or error, patient error. You know, this was back in the day when there weren't as many cross checks and balances as nursing does today. Uh, but I had ordered. This was, you know, this was as uh, as a nurse practitioner, uh, and as you know, with electronic health records. And, you know, ordering stuff in electronic health records, sometimes little glitches happen. One of the most interesting things that often happens with the records that I'm used to using is sometimes the tracker, the list of patients, you know, you got this long line of patients that scroll in front of you. Uh You go to, you go to click on one and you click on it right at the same time, the computer refreshes. Oh, I hate that. And you actually click on a different patient than what you had originally intended. But you don't realize it because you think you, you clicked on Mr. X when actually you selected Mr. Y. And in this case, Mr. X needed some insulin. Oh, boy. And, and Mr. Y, who did not need insulin, got insulin. Oh, and God. it wasn't discovered. It wasn't discovered until after he had received it. Oh, uh, wow. That probably, I'll, let me rephrase, this was not probably about my first error. Okay, this is a big error I recall uh, gotcha. working as an MP. Uh, certainly not, probably not going to be my first error ever, I can guarantee that. Yeah. But, you know, once I realized, of course, there's a mad scramble, you know, call the nurse, find out, oh, they've already given it. Okay. So you walk in the room and you say, hey, you know, here's what happened. Uh, I was attempting to order this medicine on this patient. Unfortunately, it got ordered on you. And because of that, we've got to do some stuff. I got to watch you. I got to check your blood sugar every hour. You know, here's something to eat. Go. And he wasn't even diabetic, so it probably wasn't going to be a problem. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's, it's an error, and you've got to own up to it. Uh, it's a tough conversation to have. Yeah. You know, you got to walk in hat in hand and say, hey, I, I screwed up. And in your situation, it's probably not going to be dangerous, but there's always that potential. It's going to add to your length of stay. You know, previously you're probably going to go home here in about an hour. Well, now you're not. Uh, oh yeah, it's, but you gotta you've got to own up to what happened, and you've got to you know apologize for the mistake. You have to explain how the mistake happened. Uh, and I think if you're honest with these people quickly and upfront about it, you know they're going to be okay with it. You know, every time. I've had to take that approach. If something has happened, you know, like, you know, got a wrong test order, got a wrong procedure order, you know, like an x-ray or something, got ordered on the wrong thing or ordered it wrong. You just say, hey, guys, I made a mistake. You know, work often than not, nothing bad is ever going to happen because of it, other than it adds to uh, your bill a little bit, and that usually gets written off anyway. But, you know, you just go ahead and have to explain to them, you know, here's what happened, here's how it happened probably not going to be anything bad for you, but we're going to make sure and you go on from there. 
the first meta the first meta error I ever made. Um, I, I realized I made the meta error and I went and talked to one of the doctors about it and I was like, Hey, I gotta tell you what just happened and she's like, Okay, you gotta go tell the patient and I was like, What? Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, This is what we do for medical errors, Kevin. We gotta tell the patient and that was one of the most awkward conversations I, I thought oh, I was yeah. I thought I was gonna have. Uh, the the doctor walked me back there, walked me back to the patient, and as I was getting ready to say, "Well, here's what we did," she kind of jumped in, swooped in, had the conversation, made the conversation sound like it maybe wasn't an error, but maybe wasn't the best choice uh, of right. medications. It was uh, it was putting Lido with Epi into a digit for a digital block, and. Uh, she said, no. which we now know probably isn't a big deal, but at the time, at the time, yeah, at the time we were like, yeah. I was, I was afraid I was going to make this guy lose his finger, and you know, the doctor, right. had, you know, was like, hey, this is, you know, probably not a big deal, but we don't really know for sure. So she right. went back there and she's like, hey, here's here's the deal. We we usually don't use this medication we used on your finger. We usually don't use it on fingers. That's why it's really white, like it is. Um, <laughs> but we're gonna we're just going to kind of keep an eye on it for just a little bit. And I think we're going to be just fine. And I was like, yeah. Oh my God. But after that, I, yeah, I mean, I'm hyper vigilant after that. Holy cow. Yeah. yeah. One thing I remember uh, a little more recent, it wasn't exactly an error I made, but it was an error made on my patient. Uh, woman comes in with anaphylaxis. Although she wasn't hypotensive, she was just, you know, beet red, a little wheezy. Uh, so I ordered, you know, all the usual stuff, you know, some fluids, some IM, Epi, some solumedrol, some ranitidine, some beta or some Benadryl. And, you know, she was doing fine. And, you know, the nurse is going off to do that. And I'd actually gone to get a chart for another patient to go see. And I happened to swing through the nurse's station to talk to the nurse of this new patient I'm getting ready to go see and the alarm starts, the monitor starts alarming. I look up and I see runs of SVT and then a short run of VTAC and then back to SVT. I thought, what the heck's going on? And it's my anaphylactic patient. Oh my. Oh no. And so I, of course I run back into the room and, you know, the patient is kind of like, you know, all wide eyed and she's sweaty and, you know, the nurse is standing there and I said, what happened? She goes, well, I gave the point three of Epi IV. Oh no! I said, um, that's supposed to be IM. And of course, you know, went back real quick, checked. Yes, it was ordered as IM, but the nurse, for whatever reason, thought it was IV just because she thought maybe the patient was sicker than what she probably actually was. And so the patient had a little Epi-induced arrhythmia because of that. You know, she did in oh, the end, yeah. she did fine. But again, it's like, you know, this is the medicine we use, and sometimes we can use it intravenously for not, your not condition. For you. <laughs> just didn't you just didn't need it this time, but you still got it that way. And you know, she ended up staying with us for a while and getting troponins and EKGs and things like that. But yeah. It reversed her it reversed her anaphylaxis, that's for sure. <laughs> well certainly. Now now here here's here's the question I have for you. Did she use the cardiac epi or did she use the anaphylactic anaphylaxis epi? It was the it was point three milligrams. Okay. Of, of, of one, the, one to one thousand. The one to one thousand. Okay. Because yeah. we we had a an epi patient uh, a while back when I was a charge nurse in the I remember the nurse calling me and saying, Hey, you know, it, it says to give this I am, but I, I just can't figure out how to get this ampule so I can get oh, you know, give right. it I am. And I was like, Oh, stop, don't choose you know, tell me this on the phone. I'm like, What stop what you're doing, don't touch anything, I'll be right there. <laughs> so I was sitting there thinking to myself, I could just see her trying to figure out the ampule of how am I gonna give this I am? And I was like, Oh no, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, but she'd never given it. She'd never given it. She'd never given it. I am. She'd never given it right. for anaphylaxis. She'd never seen anaphylaxis. And this is a, an experience. This is a good ER nurse, but she just never seen it. Yeah. And I was like, holy smokes! That could have been a that could have been an error there. Yeah. Andrew, tell me about a patient who touched your heart. Uh, there's been a lot over 37 years I bet. of doing this. 
back when I was a paramedic, you know, we did, we were hospital based service. We did uh, 911 response, but we also did interfacility transport uh, of both emergent and less than urgent uh, transfers. And one of the routines we did was the hospital I worked at did not have uh, the radiation therapy machines for cancer patients. I was at the hospital across town, although both hospitals admitted patients with cancer. And there was this young guy uh, who was probably in his early 40s who was diagnosed with a horrific cancer. So he was a younger, a younger guy, has a, probably not even, if I recall even now, probably wasn't even in his 40s yet because he had a young family, young wife, young kids, and diagnosed with this horrific, it's going to kill him cancer no matter what we do. But by God, we're going to try and fight against it. And, you know, five days a week, he would get transferred over from our hospital to the other hospital for his radiation therapy. And once in a while, it would come up on my rotation and I'd be the one that would take him. And just very quickly, in a very short span of time, you know, you could just see the effect, not only the disease, but also the treatment on this poor guy. And, and rapidly cachectic and you know, rapid loss of hair and no strength, but still, you know, fighting the fight. And it was becoming the holidays, you know, Thanksgiving into Christmas. And I took him a a Christmas card one morning before our transfer. And you could tell that that really touched him. It was just, it was just a simple Christmas card. But, you know, he showed me that people have a lot of fight in them. It's probably a fight I would never expose myself to if I came down with that diagnosis myself. Just because I saw, and again, this was, you know, 35 years ago. Yeah. Things haven't changed that much in our treatment of cancer. (laughs) Not enough. But yeah, he, yeah, that was, that was one I recall. That's awesome. What a cool thing to be able to, I mean, it's it's funny how just that little kindness on, on the part of the, the care providers can really make a huge difference for the, the patients. That's kind of cool. What's the best advice a nurse mentor ever gave you? That'd probably be the woman who was in charge of the Purdue School of Nursing uh, when I enrolled there. Her name was Linnell Geddes, and she was an awesome woman. She uh, was a nurse. She was the head of Purdue School of Nursing. This was back in the mid-80s when I got accepted back to nursing school. But she also had an interesting background. Her husband, who I got to know as well through some classes I took, was a biomedical engineer, one of the top, the top guy in his field uh, throughout the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, and actually got to take some classes that he taught because I did a minor study in biomedical engineering when I was getting my nursing degree and it was interesting because one of my classes for nursing a food food nutrition class you know we met in some obscure building you know we had Purdue University is a big campus you know they squeeze in classes wherever they have classroom space And so my foods and nutrition class uh, took place in the building. It was called the Potter Hall of Engineering, just because that's where they had a classroom space. Mm -hmm. So one day I'm waiting in the hallway, sitting on the floor, waiting for class to start. And I hear this kind of squeaking wheel. I look up and it's a surgical cart draped in green surgical drapes being pushed by a guy wearing green scrubs. But sticking out from underneath the drape is the clearly identifiable snout of the dog with an endotracheal tube sticking out of it. And he wheels past me and through a couple double sets of doors and disappears. I just went, well, what the heck was that? (laughs) So 
got through class, and within the next couple of days, ran into Dr. Geddes, Linnell Geddes, the head of the nursing school, uh, in the in the nursing building. I said, hey, Dr. Geddes, quick question. And I described what I saw, and she goes, oh, that's my husband's work. So he was a biomedical engineering professor at Purdue, and they did a lot of, at the time, they did a lot of dog research uh, um, of their medical stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I got to t- talking more with, you know, the nursing Dr. Geddes. And she goes, you know, every year they have classes where they take engineering students and life science-based people, nursing students, although more rarely, also could be qualified. I put them together in a class called uh, basically the monitoring of physiologic events. And it teaches you what your medical monitoring devices do and how they do it. And he goes, are you interested? I said, you bet I am. So she got me an interview with her husband and I got into the class and it was mind blowing. The stuff I learned, not only about just physiology in general that I hadn't even realized having been a medic and in nursing school, there was still stuff I learned from that class, but also how the machines can, but also cannot give us good data of what's happening physiologically. Mm -hmm. And we did all sorts of cool experiments and things on different kinds of animals. And I won't go into the gory details because it's probably going to upset some PETA friends out there. Uh, But from that, you know, she was a mentor of breaking the mold. Yeah. Yeah, I was in nursing school. But hey, you know, there's this program over here where you can take your nursing knowledge of patient care and expand on it by learning about more about the physiology, the pathophysiology, but most importantly, how to monitor that physiology or pathophysiology. I mean, something as simple as blood pressure, uh, the different, you know, you know, invasive and non-invasive uh, manual auscultory with a stethoscope and cuff versus a uh, non-invasive oscillometric device. You know, what was the most thing, thing that I learned most about that was like your, your stand up, your general run of the mill, non-invasive automatic blood pressure. The only number that is reliable on that is the mean arterial pressure. Really? Because what that machine is doing is it's waiting for that largest oscillatory deflection. And that's the mean arterial pressure. And then every single one of those devices uses a patented mathematical, huge derivation calculation to calculate a systolic and diastolic pressure. Hmm. So even though you're getting, you know, you put the cuff on the patient, you press a button, it cycles. Oh, 120 over 80 with a mean of say, you know, what is it? 88 or 90, whatever it is. The only number that's reliable on that is the mean pressure. The systolic diastolic is a calculated number. I've never heard that. Right. And so that was just, you know, one thing. It's like, wow. Okay, cool. So That's kind of interesting. I've never, I've never realized it was just calculated and not like captured like the way I would think of doing it. And so, you know, from her, she was a huge mentor of basically, you know, follow different paths. You don't have to go this, you know, sure, nursing school, there's, you go from point A to point B to point C to point C and you graduate. But within that program is like, well, you can be doing this and you can be learning this simultaneously and seeing how it applies back to what you're doing as a nursing student and what you will be doing as a nurse. So she was probably the best mentor I ever had. Nice. And that was the best piece of advice. Nice. So you can you can step out you can step outside of the path while staying on the path. Absolutely. What advice would you give a brand new emergency nurse? Hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's good advice. Yeah. Uh I mean, I knew a long, long time ago that emergency care, emergency nursing, you know, 
this environment was where I wanted to practice. Sure, there are days that drives me crazy. Absolutely. There are days I wake up and go, God, I gotta go to work today. Yeah. Uh, but there are some days it's like, hey, I, I get to go to work today. Yep. Uh, but you know, if you decided that that's what you want to do, I mean, there's there's ups and downs, there's highs and lows. You gotta you gotta take every day as it is. It's there are days it's gonna beat you down, and you don't want to come back. And there are some days where um, you clicks, and it's like all is right with the world. Even though there's sick patients, everyone uh, okay. And so, yeah. you know, I I knew a long time ago I wanted to stay in this environment. That's why you know I became a lifetime member of ENA. I mean, I joined ENA as a paramedic. Nice. Uh, so I knew that's. That was the eventual path I was going to go. I was gonna, it wasn't going to be a medic forever. My back wouldn't take it. Yeah. Uh, there are some days it still doesn't, but you know, I knew I couldn't do that forever. I wanted to stay in that environment. And I had toyed with the idea of medical school at one point. Uh, but the interviewer from med school just pissed me off, and I said, heck with this. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And so I, I just you know, stayed on this pathway. And then and after working as an ER nurse for a while, there were, I wanted to have a little bit more autonomy. And that's why I went back to school to become a nurse practitioner. I wanted to be able to make some decisions on my own and, you know, live with the consequences of those decisions. I, I enjoyed that. Nice. Um, so I'm enjoying being a nurse practitioner. And yes, it's a collaborative practice, and I don't have a problem with that. So, I, you know, I have a very good physician group that I work with. Uh, they have taught me so many things over the years. And because of that, they have great trust in me. I bet. And so I take, I take care of the STEMIs. I take care of the occasional bad traumas we get in our small community hospital. We're, we're, you know, 30, 40 minutes away from two level one trauma centers. So we don't get a lot of bad trauma where I'm at. We, yeah. We get the occasional, you know, Medics couldn't stabilize. We're going to stop here briefly and move on. But, you know, we don't get a lot of bad, bad trauma, which is one thing I do miss. Um, but, we know, we get sick STEMIs and we get sick sepsis patients and we get bad strokes. And they trust me to take care of all of that. That's so, awesome. Uh, I appreciate their trust, but it's a trust that I've, I, I've earned because of what they've taught me. So nice. I'm enjoying it. Now you posted, you posted, I don't know, at one point I remember you posting and I remember it striking me as something that if I ever got a chance to talk to you, I was going to ask you about, <clears throat> you posted something about imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome and what does it mean? There are some days, and this is my, you know, this, this is probably not the Webster's definition, basically. Yeah. No, I don't I want that. I want, I want there, yours. There, there are some days when you think. People are going to realize I'm not as good or I'm not as smart as they think I am. And it's all going to come crashing down. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a lot of days I still feel that way. It's just like, you know, there are just some days I feel like, you know, you don't really know all this. You just act like you do. And, I don't think that's really true. I mean, I, I don't uh, think I could have gotten this far by faking it. Yeah. But there are just still some days when you think, and I think a lot of it comes from not being able to take praise well. Yeah. You know, people compliment you on something and it's just like, oh, well, no, yeah, no, don't say anything. And so <laughs> you get, you get that praise and then it kind of messes with your head. And then you start thinking, well, I mean, people are praising me for this or for that or for knowing this or for doing that, but I'm really not as good as they think I am. Yeah. That's, that starts to kind of gnaw at you a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm good at what I do. I'm certainly not the best at what I do. And there are people out there who are smarter and more skilled and can think on their feet faster, but... I still think I'm okay at what I do. I bet. <clears throat> I think that 
I, when you you posted it one time on Facebook, and I remember seeing it and thinking to myself, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's experienced that. Because I've there's been times in my career where I've thought for sure, like I'm going, what are you doing? What are you doing? Get ready to get up on the stage and tell these people about whatever. What, you don't know this. Right. You don't know this better than everyone else in the room. What are you doing? And and it yeah. and it messes with your head. Well, it's, it's kind of how I felt at uh, National ENA in St. Louis in 2017. I was scheduled to give two talks. Uh, one was on a case study of aortic dissection of a pregnant patient. But the other was a talk on novel therapies for refractory VFIT, specifically dual sequential defibrillation and esmolol therapy. Uh-huh. And, you know, I got accepted. I'm going to give the talk. No big deal. You know, given the talks before in other, you know, in other forums, just kind of to tweak it, make it, you know, a little bit more nice for, you know, the national audience. Yeah. And two days before I show up to St. Louis, I get this email from ENA saying, Hey, We've decided for your dual sequential defibrillation Esmolol talk, we're going to put you in the big room and we're going to live stream it. So not only <laughs> are all the people at ENA in St. Louis going to be able to watch you, but people at home can log in live. And it's like, what the fuck? Two days before you're going to spring this on me? <laughs> no, no pressure. <laughs> so... And it's like, okay, so, you know, I'm driving from Indiana to St. Louis, you know, with this weighing on my mind. And I got, you know, I get there the day before, and I got, you know, so I'm going to the, you know, the prep room, you know, to make sure everything's just how I want it. I made a few tweaks, got the final version uploaded to you know, the IT people there, and, you know, went and checked out this monstrosity of a room that I'm going to be talking in. I was like, oh, my God, what have I got myself into here? It's almost better not and, to. Yeah. And uh, so I thought, you know, the day before was when uh, there was like a gathering the evening before when Jeff Solheim had Alex Wubbles, the nurse who stood up for the drunk patient, yeah. and got arrested. Yeah. yeah. So she was a surprised, you know, special guest at ENA that year. So everyone was crazy, crazy, crazy about Alex Wubbles, Alex Wubbles, Alex Wubbles. Oh, she's here, she's here, she's here. Everyone's getting selfies with her and pictures with her and all that good cool stuff. Uh, you know, because she, she did a great thing for emergency nurses, and you know, it was wonderful. So I decided I'm going to open up my talk in front of hundreds of potentially not thousands of people with a joke, because, you know, that always breaks the ice so well. <laughs> and, you know, so I get introduced, I get up on stage in front of this, you know, the biggest room in the convention center. And, of course, it's, you can't see who's there because you're all blinded by the light and it's dark out there. Of course. That's a good thing. So I said, you know, hey, you know, I want to welcome everybody to ENA 2017 in St. Louis. We're just now being referred to as the Alex Wubbles Love Fest. Oh, no. And there was like, there was like fucking crickets in the room. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, that didn't go over as well as I had hoped. <laughs> oh, no. She yeah. was in the audience, wasn't uh, she? I don't know. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a slam against her at all. I, I thought it was a, one, she did a great thing. She did the right thing, and she stood up for her patient, and, you know, she did everything right. And it was great that she was at ENA. And I was just kind of poking fun at the fact that everyone was, like, going wild crazy over her. And it was great. She needed that moment. But I was just, I probably took it the wrong way. <laughs> That's funny. It was like, oh, well, you know, you try to be funny. Sometimes your humor bites you in the ass. Yeah. And that yeah. only just that only just can further contribute. Then I'm going to crash and burn on this stage, no matter what I say. Oh, I'm sure you did fine. It's, but boy, that's <clears throat> it's always hard when you like put something out there and you're like, hey, this is kind of funny, and then you're like, mm, that didn't really go Not that so much. You know, I've I've got a very dark, sick, sarcastic sense of humor, and I like that. Some days you. that just doesn't work out so well. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that about you. <laughs> I mean, I gave a talk uh, last year at one of our local trauma centers. I got invited to speak at their annual trauma conference, and I was going I spoke about uh, intentional and accidental hanging injuries. So I've had a few good case studies that I, I incorporated, but I so badly wanted to use the video clip from Blazing Saddles 
where he says, they said you was hung, and Cleveland Little says they was right. And the nurse I work with and love to death at the trauma center, she goes, no, you can't use that. She's like, no. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. But, damn, it really does fit my talk very, very well. <laughs> That's funny. That's really funny. One of the first national nursing conferences that I did, I did the SES conference one year. And I look, uh-huh. I look out in the audience. I'm getting ready, and getting set up, and you know, it's usually like a who's who of ENA. You know, we have different ENA board members there. The the right. um, current president was there at the time, and I'm getting ready to do a, a lecture on stroke, which I I knew real well. And I was like, you know, getting ready to do this lecture, and I look in the audience, and I have the president of ENA in the audience. I'm sitting there going, okay, that that's a little intimidating. But then Gene Prail comes in and sits into the audience, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, "There you go. Okay, what what am I going to teach Gene Prail about? What am I going to teach Gene Prail about anything with emergency nursing? I'm like, she wrote the book on emergency nursing. I mean, right. I was like, right, holy cow! And and I was sitting there, I was so intimidated by that. I remember doing my presentation, going, "Oh Lord, let's see how this goes." Did the presentation, it went fine. And she, you know, I, I got a chance to meet her afterwards and went up and um, she came up and introduced herself and said hello. And it was, it was awesome. She was fantastic. She was so lovely. And, and it, you know, wasn't near the pressure I thought it was going to be. Um, but sure enough, it was a little intimidating at first. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 I've had those moments myself where you look out there and it's like, oh, oh what are they doing here? <laughs> yeah. You're like, hmm, okay. Well, all right. That's funny. So the last question I have is a question I'm going to ask everybody, and this one's kind of a hard one. But the last question is uh, a question that I like to call three things. And it's the three things that an emergency nurse should always remember and three things an emergency nurse should just go ahead and forget. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, one could be flip and just say, no, don't forget to eat, don't forget to pee, and don't forget to chart what you did. <laughs> Pretty good advice. Remember to always do those. Always remember to do those three things. You know, if you got the opportunity to do the first two, take it, and always, always, always do the third. Yeah. Um, things to forget. Uh, hmm, shoot, now you got some tough questions here, man. I know. I know. This... So, don't forget why you chose nursing. Uh, you know, certainly no one chose nursing because you're going to be driving a Ferrari or live in a mansion. You, know, you went in nursing to help people. So don't forget that's why you went into nursing. Yeah. And always, you know, do your best every day to help people to the best of what you're able to do. And that might be limited by resources or what you can do at your hospital uh, or the competence of the provider leading the care and you know they're going down the wrong path you know just you know don't forget why you went into nursing and take that to your bedside every single day uh, don't forget that they're and i've said this recently uh, spontaneously at a uh, nursing symposium at my alma mater at purdue don't forget that there is honor and pride in being a bedside clinical registered nurse Absolutely. There seems to be this mindset now, and it's being placed in the nursing students' minds by the schools that you should no longer be satisfied with being a registered nurse. You need to be an advanced practice nurse. And this conference I went to, uh, it's our annual uh, school conference that they have every year. It's called the Helen R. Johnson nursing leadership counselor. She was the founder of Purdue School of Nursing. This year's theme was, are you ready for a master's degree or a doctorate in nursing practice or a PhD? Then you go for it right now Hmm. without any experience of being a nurse. And I listened to that for about 45 minutes. It was a panel discussion uh, of nursing, recent nursing school and advanced practice school graduates. And I stood up in the back of the room with about 300 people, and I said, this is wrong. There's honor and pride in being a bedside registered nurse. I love being a nurse. There were reasons I went on to become an advanced practice nurse. Those are my personal reasons. 
But to be told by a nursing school and to be told by a nursing organization that the only reason school is a stepping stone to become an advanced practice nurse is wrong. Absolutely. We need nurse we need nurses. The only reason hospitals exist is because nurses are there to take care of patients who can't do what they need to do for themselves. That's what nursing is about. We're taking care of patients. The hospital is a building that puts all of those factors in one convenient place. But the patient is always, always going to need a nurse. Nursing care. And, and there, there should not be the mandate that nursing school is only there to serve as a stepping stool to become something else. You're going, I went to nursing school with absolutely no thought in my mind ever that I would do anything beyond that. I was going to nursing school because I wanted to be a nurse. And it was only about 13, 14 years later that I said, I still enjoy this and I can still do this. But at that time, I wanted to do something more. And that's why I went back to school. Okay. But it wasn't with the thought in mind that I walked into my freshman first day of nursing school and says, yeah, this will do for now, but it's because I'm on my way to this. And that yeah. should never be the mindset. Yeah, if you want to become an advanced practice provider, go to PA school. Yeah. Don't waste your time getting your nursing degree because you're not going to have the clinical experience as a nursing student to go right into a master's or a DNP program and come out on the other side and be competent to take care of patients. Okay. If you want to go a rapid path, go to PA school because you're going to get that clinical experience in a more professional format. If you want to become an advanced practice provider and do things like that, go to PA school or go to med school. Don't go to nursing school with a thought in mind that it's a stepping stone to something else just because for that reason. So don't forget, we need nurses. And that's why you became a nurse. Absolutely. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to get lambasted for that section. I can tell you that right now, but that's okay. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you will because I think, you know, so many schools out here in Houston are, are really – Pushing, pushing the, you know what I what I jokingly call zero to hero, you know you go from, they're they're taking brand new nurses with absolutely no experience and putting them into NP programs, and I was like that, yeah. that was never the, I don't think that was ever the thought like, they're gonna get out and they're not gonna have any life experience they're not gonna have any nursing experience they don't have that that mental rolodex of patients that they've seen they're not gonna recognize right. those patterns that they're you know that they're seeing as a nurse practitioner that isn't as a, you know, a, a long time bedside nurse, stretcher side nurse would see it's, it's crazy. Well, you know, and you, and you gave the example in our talks here today, your nurse colleague who had never seen anaphylaxis before. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, you know what if she, then she or he went on to become an advanced practice nurse and had never seen anaphylaxis before. And, and, and it's funny. She was in NP school. She was in NP school at the time. And I was just like, Holy cow. Then you're right. I, I'd never made that connection, but you're absolutely right. And it's, it, you know, it, and there's something to be said for being a bedside nurse and being a stretcher yeah. side nurse that you're right. There, there is honor in that. And then finally, thirdly, you know, third thing that I don't forget is, and I fail at this miserably, but I try to tell myself almost every day, you have to leave work at work. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. You know, you work an eight to 10, most likely a 12 hour shift and you never get out on time and it's, it's busy. It's stressful. You're short staffed. You feel administration doesn't have your side. The patient's always right, no matter how wrong they are. Yep. Don't forget to try and leave all of that crap at the door as you leave the ER. And go home and divest yourself of all that. And I say this with complete honesty. I fail at that miserably. Yeah. But that's what we need to try to do. Yeah, yeah. it's okay to say, you know, I'm not saying it's wrong to go home and say, you know, you know, could, could today have been a better day? How can I fix this? You know, it's okay to try and fix the problem, but don't let it consume your outside of work life, as so many of us, me included, seem to do. Yeah. Uh, worry about things, fret about yeah. things, dwell on things, try to figure out things, 
you know, give yourself some time to break away from that environment and enjoy what you've got. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's hard to, you know, when I, when I was a director, it was hard to, I wasn't allowed to leave work at work. I mean, I was, I was on call 24 seven and if, if the phone rang, sure. I had to pick it up. And, and in my new role, you know, where if, if you know, when I'm off, I'm off. I don't, I don't check my phone. I'm not checking my work email. I don't check my work email when I'm off for days. Um, but it still doesn't mean I'm not wondering how things are going. Still doesn't mean that I'm not wondering, you know, where are we? You know, do we, do we get the beds emptied? What happened to that patient that was coming? Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to take it out of work, uh, and, and leave it there. Right. I can't even imagine for a practitioner, it's gotta be, you know, yeah, I would imagine I would go home every day just kind of going, did I make the right call there? Oh yeah. That's why I say I fail miserably at this advice. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. That's, that's gotta be, that's gonna be one of the hardest things, uh, in, in all of, in all of nursing. It's gotta, and you know, the idea that, you know, these pa- there's patients that you'll never forget. And sometimes that's, you won't forget the ones from last night versus ones that you, you wake up thinking about, you know, from years ago. Yeah. A lot of old, a lot of old ghosts sometimes, I bet. A lot of old ghosts, a lot of old ghosts. So again, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's been a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll meet up in Austin. I'm not going to make any promises, but I'm going to try and get there, but we'll see if we can cross paths there. Well, if you come, I'd love to love to hang out with you and say hello, and, and I hope you do make it. All right. Looking forward to it. Okay, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. See you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Art of Emergency Nursing Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast and follow us on Facebook.